Man, praise the Lord. Welcome everybody to this Tuesday Bible study. It's Tuesday, April 16th, year of our Lord, 2024. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, who's joining me tonight to dig deep into God's word. And I'm so honored and happy that you're here with me to go throughout God's word. I mean, we're studying right now the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter two. It's going to take a little while to get through because there's like 28 chapters. <laughs> In the book of Acts, but we're going to go all the way through and we're going to read God's word. We're going to read it together and Lord willing, he'll open up our understanding and give us uh, better, better knowledge of the scriptures and who he is as God and who we are in relation to him and what our purpose is. So I'm going to go uh, first start off by praying. Let me go ahead and get the chat set up over here. Chat set up. Okay. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it is a light into our feet, that it guides us, Lord God, that it is a lamp, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you use your word to illuminate all dark spaces, Lord God, in ourselves, in our minds, in our hearts, Lord, that you will reveal your truth to us, Lord, and through that truth that we may be transformed by the renewing of our mind, Lord. But Lord, not only by the written word, but by your spirit also, Lord, the Holy Spirit. So we welcome you Holy Spirit, into this live stream, into this Bible study. You say, have your way, have your will. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this nation, in this church, Lord God, in the supernatural life. I thank you, Father God. I give you honor and glory for what you're doing. Lord. And I pray that you'll bless the ears and the eyes of the hearer and the see and the seer so that they may see the word, that they may hear the word, that it may be open to them, Father God, that you will remove any scales that you'll unstop any ears, Lord God, Lord, that you will move and have your way through your word, Lord, and you will be glorified, Lord. Use my mouth, Lord, for your glory. Use me as a willing vessel in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good evening, Sister Jennifer. Good evening, Sister Deborah. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, and we'll go ahead and get started. So in chapter two, where we left off, I left off right after Peter was explaining to the men in Jerusalem, men and women that were gathered after the, well, while the day of Pentecost was still happening, Peter, after speaking in tongues, after all the congregation that were in the upper room were speaking in tongues, and they were gathered together, Peter stood up and began to preach to them. And so what I find interesting about this is Peter preached to them, and it seems like all of them understood what Peter was preaching. Now that's another uh, hat or let's see, tip in the bucket, hat in the bucket, tip in the hat. I can't know. I don't know what the the uh, what you call that saying is exactly, but it's it's another tip in the hat, I guess, of my theory of that Peter and all the apostles when they were praying in tongue, it, it was being translated to the hearer rather than being translated out of the mouth of the speaker. So it was being translating, translated on the receiving end instead of the broadcasting end, right? And if you work in networking or anything like that, you know about broadcasting and receiving. So when Peter stood up, it's obvious that everybody there was able to understand him. So whether he was speaking the Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Greek dialect, that was uh, what, they had, what they knew, or whether he was speaking and it was being translated, it doesn't really tell us, but it does say that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. So it was enough to add 3,000 people. And it says that they were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Amen. So and here's the promise in this, or I would say here's what a pattern that we can see for the church today. Instead of trying to get everybody into the church with entertainment and things of the world, which we see is in the news right now, and it's a pretty hot topic. But instead of trying to get people in with entertainment to be saved, we need to get people in with the word of God and the truth of God and the presence of God. We can't replace uh, the word in the presence of God with entertainment because it doesn't work. It, it only leads to needing more entertainment to keep those that you brought into the church with entertainment in the first place. Amen. So what you need to do is you need to present the word and the presence. And the only way you can have the presence is to honor and reverence the Lord in the congregation and seek his face and seek his will and read his word and preach the gospel. And God's presence will be there. Uh, it's evident in our church that God, his presence shows up every time we have service. 
and it's nothing of us, but it's of his will because we preach his gospel, we teach his word, and we seek his face. So that's what's needed. And God will add to your church or your congregation or, or your home group. He will add according to his will if you will preach the gospel, if you will teach his word, if you will present his presence, the Holy Spirit, if you don't quench the Holy Spirit, if you don't block the Holy Spirit from moving, he will add the people to the church. It's so paramount uh, that we realize that because if God doesn't add to the church, the Bible tells us that, you know, some water, um, some, some, um, some plant the crops, some water, but it's God that will give the increase. It's God that will give the increase. So God is giving the increase in the churches in the book of Acts here. And thousand are the increase that heard the word of the Lord. Okay. And I want to point something out that I was studying this earlier and that's, and I started and it almost made me late to go live, but I was studying this and it's interesting because I tell people I used to be King James only um, until the Lord opened my eyes to that and brought me out of that and uh, showed me the beauty of his word and studying in different uh, versions. Well, it's all the same version, but different translations. Uh, right now I'm in ESV, but if you go, I want to read verse 40 real quick. And it says, and with many other words, he bore witness and continue to exhort. That means to build up, to uplift them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So one thing that I do think is better in the King James um, or the new King James, instead of saying, save yourselves, which if you read that today in your English speaking, you know that that's just a phrase like save yourself, save yourself. So it's not meaning that you can save yourself. But if I was reading this 50, 60 years down the line, I have my sneaky cup. If I was reading this 50 or 60 years down the line, I might think that the Bible's telling me that I can save myself and I can save myself from this crooked generation, right? But if you read uh, the same one, let me let me go over to King James. It's nice to have all these versions at your fingertip. It's it's such a blessing. We have such an access to the Word of God today, but so few people actually dig into God's Word and read it. And the King James says, "Save yourself as well." But there's a word here that I wanted to pour, point out in the King James, untoward, right there. Can anybody, without looking this up in the chat, tell me what untoward means? This untoward generation. Without looking it up, don't look it up. But can you tell me what this means? All right. I had to look it up. What is untoward? I think the New King James Version is the one that I like in this one, where it says, be saved from this perverse generation, right? So how do you do that? Up, up above. It's telling you up above how to be saved. Paul, Peter just, just preached all about what it means to be saved. So I like this better. And it says perverse generation. Okay. Uh, the ESV uses crooked generation. So there's two words there. So if you know anything about, and, I, and I've had to learn this over the years, if you know anything about translations and how they work and going from one language to another, there's no one-to-one -one equivalent. So from Hebrew to Greek, to English, to Spanish. There's there's not a one-to-one -one that we can make. So nobody's nobody's pasted or copied yet what untoward means. But there's no one-to-one -one translation that, that perfectly fits what's being said in the original. So the best way to get the best understanding of the Word of God would be if you know how to read Hebrew, you know how to read Aramaic, and if you know how to read Greek, right? And even then, even within Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, even English, Words change over time. So over time, meanings of words change. And I'll give you an example of a big one right now. I hope this video doesn't get blocked, but gay. Gay is a big one that has changed a lot. Whenever I was, uh, not, I, not me, I'm not that old, but whenever, <laughs> whenever my parents and grandparents were younger, in the 40s, 50s, gay meant happy, right? So gay, gay, the word for gay has definitely changed. Because there was a lot of songs in that time that would use that word gay. Oh, I'm so gay. I'm so gay. Right. Not meaning that they're so gay, what we would say now, but meaning that they were happy. So words change. New words are invented. Slang words are invented. Some words that I'm so old now. I'm getting to that place. I'm not so old, but I'm getting to that place now in my age where words have changed, where I don't know what the younger generation is saying. Right. My, my oldest daughter will 
when she wants to confirm something with me, she'll say bet. I'm like, what is what does that even mean? What are we betting? Right. So that's just the, the fact that we're the generations are changing. Words are changing. So I want to go back to that word in King James. Right. King James untoward. And so I have it. I actually pulled it up on my phone because it's easier. Uh, I'll get better at sharing the screen here. 30, yeah, I'm 37. I'm only 37, but I feel older. Okay, so the Oxford Dictionary for untoward means unexpected and inappropriate or inconvenient. Okay? So if we put this in the King James or in the Bible, and we say, well, save yourselves from the unexpected generation or the inappropriate generation. Inappropriate fits a little bit better or the inconvenient, right? So that's the Oxford for untoward. And then if you look up uh, the Webster's, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Webster's. It says difficult to guide, manage, or work with, unruly, or intractable. Okay, so none of those really. Yeah, wise beyond my ears. Exactly. You're, you're distracting me, my wife. <laughs> Love you, honey. So none of those would give you the proper what Peter is trying to declare here and show here, right? So I do think. Crooked or perverse would be a better word used in verse 40. Save yourselves from this crooked or perverse. And in Philippians, it says crooked and perverse. But it's both of them there. But save yourself from this crooked and perverse generation. Okay. So the word crooked emphasizes ones who are warped, having turned from the truth and toward depravity. Okay. That, that, that aligns with what Jesus says about this generation what Jesus says about the, the world's um, predisposition, our predisposition of our heart is against God, right? So here, Peter, using that word crooked would, would fit really well. And perverse means that which is twisted and distorted. So similar meanings, not exactly the same, but similar. And if you really wanted to know, if you were a native speaking um, and you knew Greek, uh, and you're native speaking, you could probably read that and get the correct meaning because that's what it was written in. So you would get the fullness of the meaning. So if you can learn Greek or if you can learn Hebrew, I would highly suggest you do that um, because that would really help out in, in serious Bible study. Um, so that's what I'm saying. But we have this. So we, we trust those that have translated the word of God from Greek, from Hebrew, from, you know, the Aramaic text into what we have now in English. And that's the reason, even, even King James, right? We trust that what was written by the scribes was written and copied correctly, but we now have many scriptures, many scrolls, many ways of checking and verifying that the words are correct and the same. And those that are not, um, we highlight or we look at or we put emphasis on, right? So that's a whole other uh, debate topic, or not debate topic, but a whole other topic to get into and study. But I just wanted to point that out before we continue on so that many can understand why we have uh, the certain translations we do and why they change and why uh, King James, you know, there's the 1611 King James, which was original that it was translated in, and now they have revisions of that. And you... Open up a 1611 or find a 1611 King James online. It is extremely hard to understand, if not impossible, because so many words have changed. So many words have uh, uh, different meanings of what they did. And some words don't even exist anymore. There are some words we don't even use anymore. They're in the King James. That's why it's good that we continually update with new words, but keep the same meaning and keep the same uh, meaning what what original apostles and what Jesus said. Okay, so we'll continue on, and that's the end of that digression. So uh, we'll continue in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is building the church. Okay, this I used to wonder, what is the secret to building a church? And I'm not talking about wanting a mega church or you know, if the Lord one day decides that we have a big church or we have multiple churches or, you know, praise the Lord for that. But what I'm what I'm what I'm showing here is, you know, you think that there's certain secret sauces to doing things. But the Lord, but the Bible is very plain about how to do things and how to make growth happen. So in the early 80s, going into the 90s, there was a growth. 
I don't know if I'm going to get into this or not, but I'll kind of go into it a little bit. Kind of like in the business world, uh, there's a way to grow your business, right? And they kind of move that and use that blueprint into the church world. And so they would go out and find unchurched people and say, hey, why you left the church? Why you don't like the church? You know, and they would try to cater to those unchurched people, try to get them to come into church. And it was very successful. And it was more based off of a business model of finding what they called felt needs, meaning hey, I feel I need this in church. I feel I need that in church. I feel like I need, you know, a church that, that, that instead of, you know, always opening up the Bible and reading it, I feel like we need a church where, you know, we have entertainment, more entertainment, more, more, more types of entertainment that don't really have anything to do with the word of God or the spirit of God or the reverence of God. Right. So in that, when you go down that road and you're no longer using the word of God and you're no longer using the spirit of God to attract those that God uh, ordains to come into your service, to come into your church, to be saved. When you no longer do that, when you're using the worldly methods to try to attract, you're going to get worldly results. And not only that, but people will grow tired of those results and they'll want more because the, the way the flesh works, the way sin works, the way that our nature is, is we're not just satisfied with a little bit of sin, with a little bit of entertainment, when it comes to fleshly things, we want more and better and bigger and explosions and pyrotechnics and smoke and fog machines and lights and on and on and on. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with uh, certain things in the church that are not entertainment wise. But what I'm saying is when it grows to the point where you have to keep your congregation by doing that, otherwise you'll bleed members. And there's too much of an emphasis on having uh a lot of members in your church, but not having discipleship, not not discipling the ones that you have and growing them. And look, and this says they devoted themselves, verse 32, to the apostles' teaching. So what did they devote themselves? The teaching, apostles, what the apostles taught, and the fellowship, fellowshipping together, because when you come in together in communion with one another. So I'm sorry for every Christian that doesn't believe that we should fellowship or that they have to go to church to be with Jesus. No, you don't have to go to church to be with Jesus, but you're not going to have accountability. You're not going to have accountability for your soul and you're not going to have community to help build you up. Okay. If you're a lone ranger Christian and it's so easy to be that type of Christian, especially now, like you can come onto my Bible study anonymously and watch it. And, you know, Lord willing, you get something from it, or you can go for another preachers or another teachers or this online service or that online service. And you can get, you can get fed, but you, you won't have any actual community. And, you know, you, you I know people that come to our church that said that they're starving for community and they've been places and they didn't really feel that community. And thank God they said that they found it in our church. You know, I'm glad for that. And, and I'm, I'm happy for that. So those are the ones, you know, they, they start out online. They look around, they find community once they find a church and they get plugged into that church and they get planted there and they grow. That's another thing you can't properly grow without having that community. But another thing with only wanting church online is on, and only wanting, uh, you know, to be the Lone Ranger Christian is that you're saying, I don't want I have pride and I don't want others to uh, help keep me accountable for my life, for my walk with Christ. The, the early church was all about accountability. The, the early church was all about of accountability. And so that's what it is. We, we have accountability towards each other. We have accountability towards God. and we keep each other in that place, right? And another thing that the church needs to do when we come together is to build one another up, you know, in time, talents, finances, things of that nature, so that we all, if you'll read a little bit later on, it says that they all had all things in common, right? So they were all working together and for the common good, and they all were sharing what they had. So we don't see that in a lot of churches today. And that's what we're striving for in our church, in Jesus' name. So verse 43, oh, let me go back to 42. And the breaking of bread and the prayer. So they broke bread together. They had meals together. Recently, my church, our church started doing uh, potlucks together after every service. And it's really helped to grow us together as family because we spend more time together as that. We spend more time together in the Lord's presence. We spend more time together just fellowshipping. And prayers, prayer is so important for the church. Because if you have a good, strong prayer intercession in the church, you will also have a, a strong leadership in the church. And it's much 
harder for the enemy to try to find a crack in the in the in the community that way. So that's what uh, they were doing in the early church. This is what was growing the church. Okay, this is what was sustaining the church. This is the model that the current church needs to get back under and back to. And it says, verse 43, and all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So they had an all and they had because of the signs of wonders. Uh, they had that 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 um, that awe and wonder was coming upon them because God was moving. And this is what I believe. I believe when when the times continue to grow darker and as the church becomes more persecuted, as truth becomes more persecuted and as we go back to the actual biblical truths, as we go back to actually walking out um, that book of Acts church and living amongst each other the way they did and breaking bread together and fellowship and praying for one another and getting away from sin and darkness and drunkenness and all these other things. I believe that more signs and wonders and miracles will happen in the church because we are walking in the light and not in the darkness. And it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. So the early church did something that nowadays it's very hard for us to do. Very hard for us to do. And that is to have that uh, being that togetherness. So they sold everything in the early church. They sold everything that they had. Not everybody did, but most sold everything that they had and they come together and they lived a communal lifestyle. Uh, and they lived a lifestyle where they were together basically all the time, praying and working together and glorifying God. And, you know, Rome, as big as Rome was and as big as Jerusalem was and as big as all these cities in the ancient East were, they still pale in comparison to what we have city-wise today, just in San Antonio where I live now, seven million people, but I'm secluded in my box, my house, right? So I'm secluded here. I could live the rest of my life and not talk to anybody, have my food delivered, you know, work from home and things of that nature. So I, I would never have to talk to anybody else uh, personally, if again, if I didn't want to, if I had the funds to do that. Then in this time, you couldn't do that. The walls were thin. Families lived together sometimes in one, maybe two rooms, you know, so they were all huddled together. The cities, while they were big, were not like they are now. People knew each other. So it was a lot more tight knit community where that could thrive and that could happen. Today, it's a lot harder for that to take place. So we so it's even more important that we open ourselves up to godly uh, brothers and sisters in correction and. Um, having accountability one to another because it's so easy to go off and get into secret sin, you know, just having a cell phone, right? So easy just to go off and to do that, but to have accountability around you and have somebody questioning you and have somebody, you know, there to guide you and to help you and to have elders and to have just people who are mature in the Lord. That's what helps keep, keep us uh, in that accountability place. Of course, the Holy Spirit does as well. Right. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate teacher and guide and ultimate accountability. But some of us grow. It, it becomes really easy for us to block out the voice of the Holy Spirit, especially if further you go off into sin and the things that we're not supposed to be going in because we allow the lust of the flesh and the temptations to take over. So it's very important. Verse 45, and they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing to the proceeds all as any had need. OK, this is a. Uh, form of socialism uh, as much as people hate socialism and I'm not I'm not a socialist you know um, we live in a capitalistic society but this is pretty much early form of that where they everybody was selling their own possessions and everybody had they, they distribute out the proceeds now the one thing be between socialism and capitalism today is socialism usually turns into forced socialism meaning you have to sell what you have and then the, the funds get funneled to the top, usually to one ruler, and it doesn't get distributed equally, and, and it, it leads to a big mess. But this was the type where everybody had each other's own best interests at heart. Because you got to understand, they were in that moment of first love. 
Remember when you first come to Christ and you first got saved and the Lord first transformed your heart? They were in that moment of first love. So everything that they were doing in the church during this time was coming from that pure heart. Now, I can't speak for every everything, but what we read here, it was coming from that pure heart. It was coming from that pure place of motives where the, each other wanted to help each other. Now, if you tried that today, it doesn't work because there's always those that rise up that want more than the other or greed steps in and they don't have the heart posture of Christ. Right. That's what the the the. That's what the biggest difference is. And that's what makes the most difference is, is your heart changed for Christ? Is it different? Are you transformed? And when you become transformed, that's when. That's when you have this. That's when you have that type of fellowship going on. And it says, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. So every day they were going to, um, they, they, were, they were, every day they were together, they would attend the temple on Sabbath. And they would do this until the, until the, uh, until the Christians, the ones that were being called Christians at the time, when they started to be called Christians, they were doing that until they were kicked out of synagogue and they could no longer go to synagogue. But they would go into the synagogue on Saturday and those that were able to teach or had knowledge of the scriptures would try to convince the other Jewish uh, teachers there and Jewish people there that Jesus was the Messiah, that Yeshua HaMashiach was the Messiah and that he was the one that was to come and he came and he died and he rose. So that's what their mission was when they would go into the temple. And then they would meet that following day as a um, as a way to celebrate. For themselves, because if you go into the if you go into the temple on Saturday, they're not going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. They're going to read to you the scriptures. They're going to read to you the law of Moses. They're going to read the portion of the Tanakh. You know, they're going to read that that portion of scripture, and then they're going to have a teaching on it. But they're not going to celebrate Jesus. So what did they do? They come up with the next day the ability that they would go and they would celebrate Christ. They would celebrate Jesus, okay, and they would celebrate the resurrection. They would do communion. <clears throat> and it says, and day by day, they attended the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. So they were eating together. They were having meals together. We need to do this more as a church. I know that things are a lot busier today. Uh, the, the enemy is really good at keeping us busy. So we don't do things like this. And that's actually what's led to a lot of disconnecting in society and what's led to a lot of uh, the, the Bible tells us because iniquity, because sin will become so great in the world that the love of many will grow cold. And that's the reason why that's what's happening. You know, you see people walking around cell phone on their face all day and I'm guilty of it, too. Right. And you, they walk around and, and then they don't really have meaningful interactions. And so it leads to a lot of depression. It leads to a lot of suicide. It leads to a lot of loneliness. And it's not good. It's not the way God created us to be. We are created to be in communion with him and communion with believers. <clears throat> And they had glad and generous hearts. So their hearts were new, were new in Christ. It was, it was brand new to them. It's showing here the stark difference. If you read about how society operated in, uh, during this time when this was going on, go back and read. It was not like this. This is one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that when Christians were being persecuted and killed, they were praying for their persecutors. They were singing songs. They were they were witnessing even miracles in that time where they couldn't even kill some of them. Some of the stories that you read because God was protecting them and was showing his favor and was showing his power. And that actually converted a lot of uh, the Romans and non-Jewish and even some Jewish because they saw, you know, the love that they had for each other, the love that they had even for the people that were killing them and just how different it was from the society around them. I, I often speak this to people. But I say our modern sensibilities, our modern way of thinking, our modern thought patterns and our modern way of acting actually comes after Christ. If you look at the society and the way things were before Christ and you look at society and the way things are now, things have improved a, a billion fold. Right. And it's not just because and it's not because we've had enlightenment. And now we're all becoming atheists and scientific and things. that no, it's because. The radical moment of Jesus's resurrection, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, changed the out, the, the changed our history forever. 
And so re- literally BC and AD, BC before uh, Christ and Anno, Anno Domini, right? AD, those, that moment changed. And if you look at everything past that, or rain, uh, heinous tortures, you know, people didn't really have the, the, the care that people have today. They didn't have the understanding for people that we have today. You can see that, you know, it was just, it's really, really bad. There's, there's some good books on that and I'll uh, maybe post them to the church and the church chat uh, later on, but it really is a stark contrast before Jesus and after Jesus. And we have the, both the privilege and I don't want to say curse, but both the privilege and the responsibility that we look, we look back into the past, but we are ultimately looking at the past through the glasses that is Jesus Christ, through what he did on the cross. So we can't really fathom what it was like before, you know, because society was so much different the way that we treated people and the way things were done. So things have changed dramatically for the better since that time. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. This is very important for any pastor, anybody in uh, ministry or anybody that's um, anybody that's aspiring to open a church or start a church is that the Lord will add the numbers day by day to those who are being saved. We, we will go and we will preach. We will outreach. We will do all that we can as a church to reach the lost, but it's ultimately God that will add the people. It's ultimately God that will add those to the church who need to be there, who need to be in your church and in our church, you know, and we just thank God for that because he will send the right people for the right job because every church has a different job that God wants them to complete on the earth. And so we're different body parts that, that works individually and it works corporately and it works all across the nation and the world. The church body is always like a big organism. It's always moving and changing and growing. And it's always has its own separate um, separate task, you know, the, from the Lord that it's doing, that it's working in. Uh, okay, so we'll go a little bit through chapter three. Uh, if you're getting something out of this, if you, if you understand it, if uh, you like it, please... Uh, Type one in the chat and also uh, share. Get it out to as many as people as possible. If you think it's good teaching, if it's really helping you, helping you, if it's opening up your understanding, uh, please go ahead and share. So verse one, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame for birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go to the temple, he asked to receive alms. So here's a man sitting here, and he had been sitting here for a long time, as we're about to find out. And he's sitting at the beautiful gate, and he's asking alms of everybody that goes inside because he himself, you know, he can't go in. He can't walk. So he is, um, so he is going in. Or he is sitting there, and he's been sitting there a long time. And he asked them for alms. And it says in verse four, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive from him, something from them. So this is my theory. And this is my, uh, after reading Acts several times and wondering about this, about what happened here. Because, of course, all of us, every Christian, we want this experience with God. We want this experience with God where all of a sudden we're, we're going and doing something and God just has us fix our gaze on somebody and go over and pray for them and they receive miraculous healing, you know, their, their legs receive strength and, and that they never could have walked before. Every Christian has this desire to want to be used by God, right? We all have this desire for this beautiful gate experience where we just are used by God. Some for not so good, you know, they want to be puffed up in themselves and some just because they want to see the move of God and they want to see God heal, right? Some for good reasons and some for not so good reasons. But I prayed about this many, many times over the years and wondered, uh, you know, exactly how this happened and what was the conditions. And, you know, you, you analyze it and you're like, how do I meet these conditions? Or how do I, you know, how do I do this? How do I walk in this? And if we just, we just got done reading that they were all breaking bread, they were all together. They were all giving themselves to the apostles teaching the, the apostles had. Now, I don't know how much time had passed, 
between what happened on Pentecost and now. It doesn't really give us that much of a time frame, but, you know, it was probably pretty close together. You know, it was probably within a, at least a few months, maybe even less, a few weeks of the two events. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit on that time. And they were walking to the temple and Peter fastened his eyes upon him. He looked at him, right? And I believe that's the moment. Those that are filled with the Holy Spirit, you know that moment. That moment when the Lord gives you the unction, he pulls at your heart and he, and he, and he get by his spirit, it's a feeling, it's a pulling. And he says, go pray for that person, right? How many of you have ignored that, that small voice, right? And I think this is what's happening here by my experience with the Holy Spirit, praying for people and being led by him. And what I see when I'm reading here is that Peter, when he fastened his eyes, was, I believe, pulled by the spirit to go and and to talk with them. So it says he fixed in verse five and he fixed his attention on them. Um, I'm sorry, verse four. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John and said, look at us. And as he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something. But Peter said, I have no silver, silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, rise up and walk. So Peter was saying, look, I don't have any of the worldly possessions that you're looking for. I don't have any of that on me, but what I do have. So what did he have? He had the power and authority and the Holy Spirit. That's what he had. Because later on, if you read where Stephen is trying to um, buy the sorcerer, right? He's trying to buy uh, the, the gift of God. He says that uh, what, it, what it was said to him, he said that you think that you can buy the gift of God, but you can't, right? So the silver and gold, they had none, but what he had. It was freely given. It was the Holy Spirit. That's what they had. That's what they were walking in. The same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hasn't changed. The Holy Spirit hasn't downgraded. Some people think that because the apostles are dead, the Holy Spirit must be downgraded now. That God's no longer doing the same that he was then. But I've seen miraculous, right? I've seen the miraculous, and I know that God's still doing the same. It's God's sovereign will to do those things, and it's the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is still not working the same, then there's no reason for him to really be poured out the way that he was, right? Uh, I mean, we have the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. We have the, the guiding of the Holy Spirit, but we still have the power. There's, the power has not diminished. The, so the, the, what, what it comes down to is the timing of the Lord, the timing of the Holy Spirit. Is this something that the Holy Spirit is wanting to do? We can't force it ourselves. We can't. I can't go around into hospitals. I wish I could. I, you know, I pray for one day that we have this, but I can't go around to hospitals just laying hands on people, raising them from the dead and healing them. And what do I mean by that? I, I have the Holy Spirit on this inside of me. The Holy Spirit absolutely can, but I can't just do that anytime. Why? Because I have to be led by the Holy Spirit. That's where it's important to be led by his spirit and his spirit when his spirit prompts and says, okay, now I'm going to move through you as a vessel, now you will go and lay hands and the sick will recover and the dead will be raised, right? And those things will happen. And it has happened and God is still moving. I mean, there's, there's many stories of that. But I believe that this is what the requirement is, is to be moved by the Holy Spirit, not moved by our own emotions or our own thoughts or our own actions. Sometimes we get that mixed up. We get mixed up with our own desire to see something happen and it's not really God's desire at that moment. Okay. And we get disappointed when we're moved by our own desire and action. And we don't see happen what, you know, what happened here in the story at the gate of beautiful. Right. So that hurts our faith, even though we didn't move in accordance with the Holy Spirit. We moved with our own wants and desires. That's why it's so important to be moved by the Holy Spirit and to move with the Holy Spirit to listen to the Holy Spirit. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. So any miracle like this, any miracle that's done is going to be done for the glory of God, for God's purposes, to show God's power, to show God's goodness, and to also confirm the gospel. To confirm, oh, what makes what? Why are you different from Zeus? Why are you different from uh, all these other gods? Why are you different from Hercules? Why are you different from 
Thor? Why are you different from Odin? You know, we worship these gods. What makes you different? Well, when you see a man that's been in a gate name since his youth, all of a sudden receive sight and start leaping and jumping, it kind of confirms that, hey, the power that these men are moving by is real deal, right? And so it's it's very important. I'm going to take a drink of my sneaky cup. It's very important that we always return the glory to God. We never let anybody come and worship at our feet, right? I don't have anything. I don't have any this weird. There's some people have this weird fixation with people bowing to each other, which I don't because out of different cultures, they bow out of respect. I know in Japan, there's a lot of bowing going on, right? It's a sign of respect. It's not a sign of worship. But when they come to you, they fall at your feet and they start saying, oh God, oh Lord, and they start worshiping you. That's when the, the issue comes in. You got to redirect. You got to say, no, I'm not God. And you see this all throughout the Bible. You say, no, this is the power of God moving through us to confirm Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the Messiah, right? So that's what that means. It means that, you know, when those miracles happen, we always, always need to redirect people to the one who is performing the miracles. That's the Holy Spirit. We are just the vessels that are being used by Christ. Okay, we are the sons and daughters of God, right? We are the sons and daughters, but he uses us and he wants to keep us in that place where we understand that we are being used by his grace, by his mercy, okay? And recognize him as the one who sat at the beautiful Gabriel's tent of the temple asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is what should happen when miracles take place. Miracles, they should fill them with awe and wonder of what's happening. and it should elicit a response of praising God, and it should open up people to the gospel. This is the same thing with deliverance. I know our church operates in deliverance, right? But that's what deliverance should do, too. If we, if we deliver somebody that has not yet heard the gospel, and we deliver them and we tell them that it's very important that we fill them with the word of God, the gospel, afterwards, so that they can understand where that deliverance comes from. So the same thing here, so that this man can understand where the where the healing came from. And he's praising God, so he knows it comes from God. But it is a uh it is most important today, especially when people say crystals are healing and you know chakras are healing and uh, yogi yoga heals me through the yogis and stuff like that. That we that we make a distinction that Jesus Christ, Yeshua Mashiach, the Messiah, has healed you. And let me tell you about the truth of the gospel. Let me tell you about why he is the truth, the, the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. Verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people utterly astounded ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And I think this is important. He says he clung to Peter. So that, that tells me that maybe he's still a little bit wobbly because he hasn't, um, he hasn't done this since he was, Young, we're about to find out how long, but he clung to Peter. So it shows me that receiving strength may have just been the first part of it, the leaping up, the receiving strength, and he's being made well, but it may be a process that takes a little bit, meaning over the next hour or so, maybe he's gathering, gaining more strength and he's getting used to it. So, and this is where I also get where we pray for people multiple times, even if, you know, it doesn't seem like they're getting healed or, they're, or anything's happening because it's not done by our sight, but it's done by faith and, and acknowledging that God wants to move and that God can move and God can heal, right? And giving it over to him. So many times we want to take healing and deliverance and we want to grab it and we want to be able to make sure that it happens on our time frame when we think it's right, when we think it's best. But there's a lot of factors that God understands and knows that we do not because we only have one mind that discerns things from this perspective. Of course, the Holy Spirit leads, lives in us and discerns all things, right? But God sees the bigger picture of why this isn't happening yet, why what's blocking this or what's happening here. So he has that bigger picture and we just need to learn to uh, rely on him and turn to him and let him give us that understanding and be led by his spirit again being led by the spirit
think I jumped ahead a minute. Okay, so they ran to him in Solomon's port portigo, port portigo. I butcher that word. Now, here's another opportunity. Okay, so just like before on the day of Pentecost, now Peter has another opportunity to present the gospel to them. Now, look at what Peter didn't do after this healing happened. You know, he didn't just run off and say, well, now you're healed. He didn't, he didn't point the people to himself and said, yes, now come follow me and I'll teach you all this wondrous things of how to heal and how to do this. And, you know, and he didn't ask them for money or to sow into them or anything like that at this point. Right. At this point, he saw how important it was, how critical it is that he preaches Christ and him crucified. OK, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, piety, we have made him walk? So by our own power or piety, we have not made him walk. So he makes him, he clarifies this. He clarifies this. It's not us. Okay. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So he's bringing this back to their memory. So he was, he, he, according to this, he was standing in front of the same Sanhedrin, the same Pharisees and Sadducees, the same leaders that had actually asked for G Barabbas to be delivered over instead of Jesus. So he was standing there. So he had some boldness here because he knew that these people had the power to take him to the same cross that Jesus had just died on. Okay, so this is real boldness here of the Holy Spirit to be able to preach to the same ones that ultimately killed your master, right? And he's he's speaking plainly, so he's not he's not sugarcoating this gospel to them. He's not sugarcoating what he's about to speak to them. He says, "Look, the God that you serve," he said, uh, "you you you killed his servant and you released him to Pilate, and you know he's being straight with them." And just like Jesus, Jesus was straight with people. He, he, his crowd went from 5,000 down to 12, right, during that loaves and fishes. And then, and then if, of the 12, you know, all of them deserted him uh, while he was on the cross, you know. So except for uh, John. So just about every apostle deserted him during that time. So it wasn't Jesus didn't come to build up the big crowds. He come to make disciples. Right. So this is the thing. Jesus didn't pull any punches and neither is Peter here. And look, he says, verse 14, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That's 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 some boldness. That's some boldness right there, because can you imagine in your mind? You're st and this is back in the Roman time. So this is back when, you know, justice wasn't fair. Like we think we think there's a lot of injustice here in America today. And there is. I'm not denying that, but you put yourself back in this time when justice was really unfair and things were really unfair to just stand up to the leadership during this time of this type of boldness and say, look, you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. <laughs> it's just it's it's just incredible to me. This is the type of boldness that will come over you in the Holy Spirit. This is the type of boldness that the church needs today to stand up. We're not even at that point right now where we're being killed or beheaded or slaughtered for his namesake. And we can't even stand up against, you know, things that are even going on in the church. Right. Stripper poles and and uh, uh, sword swallowing and all this other nonsense going on. And the alphabet movement and, the, you know, the craziness with all that. We can't even stand up to that. And they're here standing up to potentially death. Right. And it says, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the, the, has given the man this perfect help in the presence of you all. He says he's given them the, the, the perfect health. He says, look, by this name, the faith in this name has made this man strong, has made this man well. And he says, and now, brothers, look, he softens the blow, the blow a little bit. He doesn't call them hypocrites and snakes and all that. He says, and now, brothers. Why? Because he's wanting to bring this back in and say, look, you are my fellow kinsmen. You are my fellow Jews. 
I want you to be in the fold, right? So he doesn't leave them with the harsh, the harsh tongue completely. And he says, now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance. So he's softening the blow, as did also your rulers. Again, softening the blow uh, to try to bring them around where they understand. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Now, again, the key word here, this is what's missing from a lot of churches, unfortunately. This right here. Repent, therefore. Turn back that your sins may be blotted out. We all have something to repent of before we come to Christ. And even now, I still repent every day. I still say, Lord, if I have any sins that are hidden that I don't know about and even the ones that I've done that I don't even recognize or realize, please forgive me. I repent and I want to turn from it and I want to do better. Right. But this is missing from a lot of places. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Repent of what? Repent of your sins. Repent of killing the author of life. Repent of what you did. Right. Turn, turn from it. So he says, repent of that. And turn back. And you will have life, right? And so your sins will be blotted out, blotted out, blotted out. How do you know what God's voice is? Uh, Cryptid W says. So I'm going to take this question real quick. So how do you know what God's voice is? You walk with him. You open up his word and you read it and you get alone. You get alone time with the Holy Spirit. And how do you do that? So first, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you don't know the gospel, you say, Lord, I don't really know you, but I want to know you. I accept, Lord, that you died for my sins, that you suffered on the cross, that you did that for me. And I know that I've sinned and I repent of that sin. I want to change. I want to turn from my sin. I want to be made new. And I ask that you ascend your Holy Spirit to dwell inside of me right now, that I may know you, that I may understand who you are. If you've done that, if you've received the Holy Spirit, then what you do at that point is you go and you one, you open up your word and you read your word. And I would suggest that starting in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and continuing from there and then go to the old. But also you get with the Lord in secret place. What does that mean? Your closet or someplace like that, someplace where you can be alone with God and you just wait on the Lord and you pray and you say, Lord, reveal to me your voice. I want to know you. I want to know your word. I want to know who you are. I want to know your spirit. And he will. He will open up to you. He will give you that. He will let you know. And it, it may take a little time, and it doesn't happen in our time frame. Sometimes God, the still small voice, he whispers so that we make sure that we're listening so that later on when he's speaking to us, we know that it's him and we know his voice and we move by that knowing that it's his voice. But it is a walk. So it's it's not a, it's not a marathon, right? Or it's not a, a sprint. It's a marathon. So it's something that over time it builds up. And the more you seek him, seek his face, you will uh, hear him more. Whenever I was a younger Christian. Uh, so whenever I was a younger Christian, this is what I would do. And I didn't even know that I was doing this at the same time at that time. And this isn't to boast or anything, but I would get alone in a room that I had. And I would just I would read the word. I had a hunger for the word. I would read the word, but I would pray and I would seek his face and I would just seek his like I would say, Lord, show me your face. Lord, show me your face. Lord, show me your will, Lord. And I would just pray different things. But then I wouldn't just pray words out that were meaningless. But I would say, Lord, give me something to pray. And a lot of times he would give me someone to pray for. Right. And he was, and my sister would come to mind or my mom or somebody. And I'd start praying for them and I would feel his presence. And then I would understand that it's better to give than to receive. Right. Meaning giving prayer to somebody else than trying to receive your own. And over time, I just I the Lord gave me of his spirit so much that now I do see things and I hear things from the Lord that turn out to be true. And even sometimes I still question, Lord, is that you? Like, I want to say six months back, uh, I saw a man who was I was at work and I was out in my car and I saw a man who had this one uh, issue where he would always like, like all of a sudden jerk and look up and talk to himself. And I just felt so strongly the Holy Spirit wanted me to go pray for him. I just felt it really strongly. And I was like, why is that you? <laughs> you know, and man, so I was questioning even though I was. And so that was my disobedience. I had to repent for that. But even now, even now, sometimes like I, my faith is being built up. My walk is being built up and I'm being built up in such a way that 
where I can grow. And so that's what it is. It starts off small and then the Lord will grow you and he will grow your your uh, faith and understanding. No, no, no dumb question. I'll answer this after the Bible study. Uh, when we go into that, I'll answer your question a little bit more after this study. But I want to get back to this and then then I'll, I'll answer. <clears throat> or if uh, if uh, Prophet Juan, if you want to answer or my wife, Eugenia, if you would like to answer him about reading the Bible or her. Sorry, I don't want to read him. Sorry about that. OK. So repent, therefore, what we need in the church today, repent, for, therefore, verse 19, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from where? From the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus. So the only Messiah that is appointed to the Jewish people is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. He's already come. They're waiting for the Messiah, but he has already come. It's God will reveal to them, but... That's the appointed. That's who is appointed for them is Christ as their Messiah. OK, and it says when you repent and your sins are blotted out, times of refreshing will come from the where from the presence of the Lord. That's when times of refreshing will come it, or that's where it will come from is from the presence. That's why we as a church, when we're in service, we're always seeking the presence of the Lord. And it's not in the shout. It's not in the music. It's it's it, those things can help. Right. The music can help. Uh, but I want us to become reliant on moving in the Holy Spirit in such a way where the music is prophetic. The music comes forth from that intimacy, from that presence. And what happens when that music that comes from the presence of the Lord? And I know our music minister is on here, uh, Sister Rosie. But when that comes from the presence of the Lord, when 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 you feel that refreshing, it refreshes the whole congregation. And you, you leave much lighter and you leave in a state of, man, that battle that I was battling with when I come into church, I, I don't have it on me anymore. I don't have it oppressing me anymore. I don't have it, you know, just weighing me down anymore. That's that's what it is. That's what that refreshing from the Lord is. That's why it's so important to have a fresh word from God if you're a preacher, if you're a minister, and not to rely on other sermons or other places that you got your message or other things, but to have a fresh Understanding it's a refreshing when that happens or a refreshing song or a refreshing prayer. Some people get stare, stare, stale in their prayer life. They become very stale in their prayer life because they pray the same thing over and over and over again. And they don't know how to break through that prayer life because one, I believe a lot of people, they don't pray in tongues like they should. It's, it's a language between you and God. And the more you pray in tongues, the more your spirit connects because the Holy Spirit will connect to the Lord in heaven, right? And it'll connect and it will, it will, it will just flows out of you. So when you pray in that language, your heavenly language, your prayer language, it builds you up in Christ. And sometimes we don't know what to pray or how to pray for people, but it will also refresh you. How many of you in the comments can attest to praying in tongues when you're alone? Well, refreshes you and it brings you into a place where, wow, you just there with the Lord and he is ministering to you. He's ministering to your heart. He's ministering to your soul. And another thing is when you do that and that refreshing comes over you, it's like a wave. It's like a, a wave of his presence, right? So it, the, the, the rivers of living water, I love that song, right? That flow from your belly. It will begin to flow more and more the more you open up in tongues and pray in tongues. But then also it'll help you to pray with your understanding because then the then that connection is better established. What I mean, the Holy Spirit's always there. But there are times that we block out. Yes, your spirit man grows and strengthens. But there's times that we block out the Holy Spirit's voice by the cares of this world. I just preached on this last week where it talks about the, the sower and the seeds and the cares of this life choking out people, choking out believers. And that's what happens sometimes. And the Holy Spirit never gets choked, right? But our ability... To hear and understand the Holy Spirit will become choked out because of the cares of the world, because we allow things to come in, because we open doors, because we we have don't have enough time, because a lot of reasons, because, because, because the reason is I can't get with the Lord. Right. We put a lot of because I can't pray because I can't fast because I can't 
you know, get in the secret place because we put a lot of because is there. And that's why a lot of people are stagnant and even declining. You know, if you don't eat food, if you don't eat from the table of the Lord, if you don't partake from the table of the Lord, you won't grow. Your muscles won't grow spiritually. Your, your spirit man won't grow. It won't prosper. So that's why it's important uh, that we have that. And I kind of went off of what I was thinking, my original thought on that. <laughs> but it's important that those things grow and that we have that. Oh, the times of refreshing. Yeah. So that the times that's what that refreshing is. And you'll feel refreshed. So that's why the church, we need that prophetic worship. We need that prophetic word. We need that fresh word of God, that fresh manna. We need that fresh prayer. We need intercessors who know how to go to the throne room and petition to, to God about the needs of the church, the needs of the world. And this is where the church in America is very lacking, very lacking in that spiritual realm. A lot of, of well-known preachers and teachers have a lot of book knowledge of the Bible a lot of degree and a lot of understanding of the word, but they don't have the spirit or they lack the spirit. They lack being led by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 21, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So here again, Peter is petitioning to these Jewish leaders by invoking the prophets by invoking the Old Testament. So whenever you hear a preacher out on the street and they say the word of the Lord says, the Bible says, God says, we, what we're doing is we are invoking, and a lot of people don't understand the Bible, so that's why it's not as not as effective as it used to be. Because back during the day, a lot more people understood and knew and read the Bible. So whenever I said, "Thus said the Lord in His Word," this, 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 people had a better general understanding than they do now. It's a lot harder because you. Tell people about what the Bible says, and nobody nobody cares. It's so biblically illiterate, nobody nobody cares, right? Nobody's moving by the Spirit. But this is the reason why. You see it in the Bible here. You see Peter invoking the past, invoking the Word of God, in order to bring forth a truth now to the people, in order to bring Christ and a light of Christ to this current situation. So we do the same thing when we're on the street corner and we're preaching. We'll say, the Word of God says this, repent of your sins. The word of God says this, turn from your sin. The word of God says this, he will give you the Holy Spirit that will guide you. So we're introducing them to the word of God and giving them that understanding. And it says, verse 22, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. I want to give you a little bit of a tidbit on this. That's kind of an off side note. So if any of you know about Islam and I've studied Islam and I continue to study uh, not that I partake in it or I believe it's the truth, but I study it because I want to be able to help people that are in that to come to know Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the Messiah, right? So I I look at that as, as a way to show them that Christ is, Christ did die, Christ did raise, but there's a saying that says that where that, that Bible scripture where it says, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. They say that that's talking about Muhammad, and this is in the Old Testament, right? But it's not talking about Muhammad. It is talking about Jesus Christ, and Peter is bringing this scripture forth here to show the Jewish people. So the Quran was written uh, after uh, Jesus' resurrection. Like Muhammad didn't come until like 600 and something after Jesus, so 660 uh, AD, I think it was, when he appeared on the scene. So this was written before. This is older. So this is what it's re referencing. Okay. And that's a side note for anybody that wants to go into more of an apologetic stance and help uh, those that are in Islam to come over to Christianity or to come over to the truth in Christ. Right. So this is what Moses said. And this is what it's referencing to is Jesus Christ. So, he, so Peter here is opening up the understanding of the, the the Jewish people here, and he's doing it purely by the Holy Spirit, purely by the Holy Spirit. And it says, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people, meaning the Jewish people, meaning those people during that time. It's saying whoever does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. This is harsh words here. This is words that are saying in, in another verse, it says, not all my people are my people. 
This means that if you reject Christ, then you're not, not part of God's people because Christ is the chosen one that is called to save us all the sins, all the world from their sins. So he is the chosen one. He is the Messiah. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who come after him also proclaim these days. So he's telling them here. He's giving them this understanding that, look, all the prophets spoke about Christ. What they were referencing in all the feasts and all the celebrations and everything that was done, they were referencing Christ in this. And there's a, there's some books out there that, that show all the references. And I need to get these books up so people people that want to want to uh, find this and understand this. But there, it, and it takes and breaks down prophecies and shows where Christ is found all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout it, and it points to him. And it says, verse 25, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So it was that job to, 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 of Christ, right, to turn them from their wickedness. So, that, so Christ was sent to them first. Christ was sent to them first. And now as we see as we go on and further in Acts, glory to God that we are also able to come in. So I'm going to go a little bit further and then I'm going to end for tonight. And I'll answer that question if it hasn't already been answered. Verse 1, chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees come upon them, came upon them. So they were, te- they were preaching to the people and to the priests there. And as they were doing that, they crowded around them even more. It says they were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now I want to show you something. To those of you that preach out on the streets, to those of you that preach to people, and you have people that mock you, spit at you, and do things, and they don't seem to give a hoot or care about what you're saying or what you're preaching, don't be discouraged by those. Okay, those are the ones that, it happens to me every time I go out and preach or or anything like that on the sidewalk or whatever. It happens every time. The world will hate you and the world will not receive it. But even if one person, even if one person comes and they want to know Christ and they want to know more and they want to understand what you're preaching, it's worth it. It's worth your time. It's worth your effort, right? To go and do that. And I I promise as the the Lord, uh, or I tell you this, as the Lord moves on you and as the Lord continues to use you, more people will come, more people will be hungry and you'll see fruit from the seeds that are being planted in water. You'll see, you'll see the fruit. And they arrested them and put them into custody until the next day for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, there we go. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. So it was attested by the miracles that was happening there, the, or the miracle of the man that was lame and was raised, right? That miracle attested to the, the genuineness of the word, of the word of Christ. And I've heard this, I've, I haven't seen it, but I've heard it in countries where the gospel has never been preached. The many miracles and signs happen there where, where the gospel is first being preached because God goes forth with the miracles and then people preach, preach Christ crucified and then they get they, they come to understanding of God and then they're saved. And that's how it, that's the pattern here. If you're looking for a pattern in the word about how the gospel is to be preached, how church is supposed to be set up, how, how miracles and prophecies and stuff come forth, go out and start preaching the gospel. Go out and start telling them about Christ. And, and those things will come forth. Words of knowledge will come for, forth for people, you know, and, and healings will come forth because you're doing what is effective in the kingdom. So many churches and so many ministries and so many places are not doing what's effective for the kingdom. They're, they're watering down the gospel. They're not telling people about sin and repentance. They're not going out into the highways and the byways and, and compelling people to come in. And there's a lot of churches that are, and I'm thankful for those churches. God bless you if that's what you're doing. And I pray for those that are not, that they will come to the knowledge of the Lord that they will start to do that, that they will start to grow in that. And God will bless them in that. But this is the, this, there's, this is the, the, the pattern. This is how to do it. Greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. So they were annoyed because of that, right? They didn't care if it was true. They, They just were annoyed because they were teaching the people this. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day for it was already evening. 
But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of them in them came to about 5,000. That's, that's amazing. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, 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 the high priest, and Cephas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were the high priest's family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power, by what name did you do this? So they, they, they thought, okay, let's let them sleep on this. Let's let them think about maybe the punishment that's going to happen throughout the night. And maybe if we bring them back in the morning, they'll be ready to change their tune, right? <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm fair. I'm putting that in there. But then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders. So there's different times when the Holy Spirit fills us. What does it mean? It, when the Holy Spirit fills you, a, a boldness will come upon you. Uh, and then a, a, a knowledge will come upon you that's not your own, that will just proclaim things, proclaim healing. It will proclaim deliverance. It will pro proclaim prophecy. And it will be true and it will be accurate. But that's when the Holy Spirit fills you. So that's what we need to pray. Lord, Holy Spirit, fill us, Lord God. Fill us, Lord Jesus, just like you did with Peter, Lord God. Just like you did with Peter. And give us, Lord, boldness to speak. And give us, Lord, the understanding and the unction of your spirit, Lord God. In Jesus' name. And look, and then verse 8, and this is where the conversation changes, right? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you. Again, Peter is filled with that boldness and then he goes straight after it. He's like, you killed him. And now by the, the, the name of the man you killed, look, it's still working today. Look, this man is standing here because of there's power in just that name. He's not even here right now, like physically, bodily form. Christ is not even here. You killed him. But look, by the power that he put inside of us, this man is standing here healed. He's been made whole. Man. And he goes on, starts hitting them more with more truth. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. So the one that was rejected, he's like, he's like, look, you thought you were building this temple and you thought that you were going to be able to place the cornerstone here and it was going to be great and grand. But look, Jesus has become the cornerstone that you rejected. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must, must, must be saved. It's a must. It's not a maybe. It's not a, oh, maybe there's another way. It's not a, it's a must. You have to be saved by that name. There's no other name. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Whew. Being with Jesus will make people be astonished at you. I'm telling you, being in the presence of God, being with the Lord, it'll make people to be astonished at what you're doing, at what God is doing through you. That's, a, that's the thing. Being with Jesus makes people astonished. And they'll say, you're uneducated. How are you doing that? You haven't been to seminary school. How are you preaching? How are you teaching people God's word? Then be astonished. They're like, I spent, I spent eight years. Nothing wrong with that. I love to learn. I love to study. But when, when we try to grasp godly things with the carnal mind, it never works, right? We can only grasp so far. We can only grab so much of the truth unless we have the truth living inside of us, the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you to grasp all truth. It's the only way you're going to be able to do it. So for those that reject the Holy Spirit by not believing that he moves and works the same, and uh, you, you're never going to come to the fullness of the knowledge of the truth of God unless you have him. Amen. Man, that's, that's amazing. They've been with Jesus. I love that. Amen. That's your verse. I love that verse too. They've been with Jesus. That's a whole sermon right there. Have you been with Jesus? I might preach that one day. <laughs> but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition, Lord, may what you do in the miraculous, Lord, stop the mouth of every enemy. And not only that, may they become 
uh, brothers and sisters in Christ by your miracles. Lord, may their hearts be softened, Lord. May they come to know you in an intimate way, Lord God. But may every mouth of the enemy be stopped by knowing you and being in your presence and by the power that you produce through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Verse 15, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another. So they went and had the meeting. They're like, what are we going to do? Saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. See, look at that. That's the religious spirit right there. If I've ever seen it, that's the religious spirit. God is moving, doing a miracle, healing a man, saving 5,000, bringing joy to this to this place and what does the religious spirit do goes behind goes into secret meetings and tries to shut down the move of god because they're jealous or because it didn't come through them or come the way that they wanted it to and you people that have that religious spirit they allow the devil to move through them to shut down the worship and the praise and the adoration and the move of god they try their best to shut it down but you can't shut it down as we'll soon see you can't shut it down <clears throat> amen but in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Oh, this is happening today. They're afraid of that name of Jesus. I see it. I see it today. So they call, called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And listen, here we go. Here we go. Peter and John answering them again. And here's another thing. I believe it's important when you go out to witness. It's important to be sent out by twos. Jesus sent out the apostles by twos. And I don't think they're meant to go alone out into the streets and preach or out into the places. I believe that we at least need to have a brother or a sister with us so that we can have that. Someone has their back, someone praying for us, and we can switch up. And I just think it's, it's biblical. We see it all throughout the, uh, the New Testament when Jesus is sending them out and when they went out. And they usually went out in pairs. Yeah, two by two. So I do think that that's biblical. So if you go out alone, um, Please bring somebody with you. Please make sure that you have another brother or sister uh, present, you know, two brothers, two sisters, or you know a mix of all of them. Now, look, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. This always invokes the memory to me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's like, oh, king, you judge, you know. He says, whether he saves us or not, we will not bow to the idol. So this is the same thing. He's saying to them, look, whether whether it's right in the sight of God, is it right to God or is it right to you? Should I obey God or should I obey you? He says, but you must judge this because we're not. <laughs> we're not going to do it. He says, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And there's coming a time, church, when we need to be a people that says, but for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. God has been too good to us. God has been too good. We need to be the people of his presence that says, I cannot but speak of how good my God has been to me. Because the day, the day's coming when they're going to shut it down. They're going to try to shut it down, even worse than in 2020, even more in 2020. And look, this is a precursor of what's, what's to come that we look back to see also because the men's heart are the same. Nothing's changed. Everything's Nothing's new under the sun. So the same way that the devil worked to persecute the church here, when God starts moving in power more in the church today, the same way the enemy is going to try to come back and stop it, because I want you to read up a little bit further where it said it was evident. It was evident to all. Right now, it's not too evident to people that God is moving. But I believe one day is coming soon where it's going to be evident to all. So the only way that the enemy will be able to shut down what's flowing through his people, through God's people, will be to lock them up and put them to death and to behead them because the power of God will be so evident. There'll be no way to deny it. There'll be no way to hide it. The enemy won't be able to cover it up with, with lies and things like that because it will just be out in the open and people will be getting set free, healed, and delivered. <clears throat> Amen. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So it was a real miracle. He had sat there for years. He had sat there for years upon years. And I want you to think about this. 
Jesus, Jesus went to Jerusalem many, many times throughout his uh, ministry, right? And how many times might he have gone through the gate of beautiful and saw that man sitting there wanting alms and he didn't heal him, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty evident that Jesus probably went through the gate of beautiful or if he didn't, him being God, he purposely did not go. And imagine being the man at the gate of beautiful, hearing of this Jesus. He's going throughout all Jerusalem. He's going throughout all Judea. He's healing people. Blind eyes are opening. People are coming back from the dead. You're sitting there and he's like, why not me? Why not me, God? Why am, why am I not getting healed right now? You know, it's like, why isn't Jesus passing by here? Why can't, you know, and, and you think about that. And sometimes we think about that in our own inner monologue. Like, Lord, you're passing by everybody else and everybody else is getting a miracle and getting healed and getting set free. Why not me? But I tell you, sometimes God has something set up for his greater glory, for his greater time. 5,000 people come to the church, come to the church during this time. 5,000 people believe. God is always looking for the biggest catch. A miracle, I mean, and I'm not saying God will always do a miracle out in the open to catch a lot of people. I believe that God is always trying, or not trying, but always maneuvering things because he's the master planner, right? He's always maneuvering things where it will benefit the kingdom the most. And that's where we have to have our eyes set on what is benefiting the kingdom the most. And we have to have this inner, I believe in healing. I, be, I will believe for my healing. I will believe for this. Uh, but even if, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if right, you throw us to the fire and God doesn't deliver us, I'll still serve God because he's too good. And I know where my eternity sits with him. I know where my eternal home is. So while, yes, I may be disappointed in the moment, I'm still going to reach for my healing. I'm still going to reach for my deliverance. And I'm still going to reach for the hand of God because I know that he's good. And I'm just, I'm leaning on him and I'm giving all these thoughts and all these things over to him. Amen. So verse 22. Now I'm going to go to, to the rest of this next time because it's very important because this is another pattern here. And Go ahead and read on yourself and just the, the believers pray for boldness. And I want to I want to just hit on this real quick. Please bear with me. I know it's been over an hour, but the pattern here that I've been talking about, the first start of the church, how the church grew, they were together, and then how they went out by twos, Peter and John, they were moving in the Holy Spirit. God used an obedient church and obedient apostles to do his will to bring in many thousands into the church. Okay. Now after they had been um that they had been sent back to uh, to the believers. Now look what happens. Oh, we were being persecuted. Oh, you know, this happened. Oh, we may die. They pray for more boldness. They don't back down. They don't shut up. They don't cower back. They pray for more boldness. Okay. So just read that and we'll go to that uh, later on, Lord willing, uh, on the next Bible study. But I want to answer this question real quick. Make sure I answer it. Okay, uh, Cryptid says, when I read the Bible, am I looking for God's voice there or am I trying to remember it? Sorry if these questions are dumb. No, no, there's, so it's not dumb, so don't feel like it's dumb. So when you read the Bible, this is what I always did. And if you're still there, if you, if, I pray that you're still there. I would always say, Lord, I'd open up the Bible and I'd say, Lord, open up my understanding. Give me understanding of your word. And I was reading the King James. <laughs> so give me understanding of your word. I don't understand any of this, Lord, but I know by your spirit I can. And help my memorization, Lord God, point out to me Bible verses that speak to me through your word, Lord, to my situation. Give me an understanding uh, so that I may rightly divide your word, so that I may study it and, and be versed in its meaning. And that's what I would do. And I would just open it up and read. And don't worry so much about memorizing all these verses one right after another or how much you have memorized. Expose yourself to God's word and allow God's word to. I don't want to say any new agey terms. Um, what would be a good to 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 oh to, to go into your heart to be put into your heart. Allow His word. The Bible says it. Thank you, Lord. And the Bible says that He will place His word in your heart. So you open it up, you read it, and you allow Him to place His word in your heart. And when you do that, you'll grow from there. And before you know it, sometimes I preach and I. The Holy Spirit's just throwing Bible verses at me, and I can't keep up with my preaching, my speaking. 
of how many Bible verses he's giving me. And it's it's a good thing because I know that the Lord is using me during that time. But and he will, as you walk with him, as you grow with him, uh, you'll you'll be the same way. So I'm gonna pray for so we can end. Thank you all for everybody that's stuck with it for the whole time. Thank you for everybody that's watching. Pray that you receive from this. The Lord gave you revelation, that the Lord opened up your understanding, and that uh, you had a good time. Thank you, Father God, for each person, Lord. And I pray that you'll open up more of their understanding of your spirit, Lord God. Lord, that they hunger and they thirst after you, Lord, that you'll put your word in their heart. Lord, let them hide it in their heart. Let it be a treasure to them, Lord God. Let your spirit, your sweet presence come upon them, Father God. And let it be the Holy Spirit's presence over them, Lord. Let it be such a sweet presence to them, Lord God, where they just, where they're just in your presence, Lord, where they're just meditating on you, meditating on your word, Lord God, meditating in the spirit, praying in the spirit, Lord God. I thank you for that, Lord. I praise you, Father God, for this Bible study. And I pray till next time, Lord, that you'll keep and bless each person here. In Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. God bless everybody. God bless everybody. Have a wonderful night, wonderful weekend. I'll see everybody. Lord willing, at church Sunday, we'll have a shorter service um, because there's another service after us. For those of you that do not know, uh, we'll be in Brownsville, Texas on Saturday, uh, the 20th. Let me pull up the calendar. Make sure. Saturday, the 20th, yes, at 11. And Sister Rosie, if you could, if you're still on here, if you could post in the church chat what location we're going to start at, the uh, address. But we'll be in Brownsville, Texas, um, and we'll be going from 11 uh, a.m. to do Central Standard Time to do outreaches around that area and to just tell people about Jesus and to bless people. So, Father God, I thank you, and I give you honor and glory in Jesus' name.